start by solving a simple example, okay? Let's say that I'm in a train car and this train car is moving on the tracks without friction. So I'm at one edge of that car. Let's say that my mass is 80 kilograms and the train car's mass is 100 kilograms. Let's say that I actually move to the other edge, I walk to the other edge, which is L equals 10 meters away. So the question is, if I walk to the other edge of the car, How far have I walked with respect to the ground? Now, if the train car was not moving at all, then I would have walked 10 meters, the whole distance, with respect to the ground. But when I actually start walking right, the train car would start moving left. Why? Because, well, you can say, if I have velocity V, the train car must have another velocity so that the total momentum is conserved. Or you may say, hey, total initial momentum is zero, which means velocity of the center of mass is zero, so if the velocity of the center of mass stays zero during the motion, the position of the center of mass does not change during motion. Let me rewrite this. So to be able to solve this question, I'll say P total is zero, and that's M total times V center of mass. So if V center of mass is zero, position of center of mass does not change. Right. So initially, let's write this is the initial situation. And in the final situation, what will happen? This car will have moved left a little bit, and I will be on the right side somewhere here, right? Let's try to find out. Let's say that my initial, let's fix the zero to be here. Okay. So this position is at L. What I would like to find out is exactly how much I move with respect to the ground. So let me call this x1. I know the following. The amount I walked with respect to the ground plus the amount the car slid with respect to the ground must add up to what? Add up to the total length of the car. Question? No question? Okay, so x1 plus x2 equals up. Do you, are you sure you don't want to ask about this? Is everyone clear on this point? How much I have moved with respect to the ground plus how much the car has slid must be L. Now, obviously, I need to find out 
what these the, the position of the center of mass is. So in the initial case, what is x center of mass? Well, it's m1 times x1 plus m2 times x2 divided by m1 plus m2, right? Well, where is the my initial position? My initial position is x1 is 0. How about the center of mass of this car? Well, I would assume some sort of symmetry, so it must be right in the middle. Okay? So that's going to be x2 will be L over 2. Question? M2 times x2? In the center of mass equation here, yes? I did not write it, m2 times x2. You see it as? Is this better? Uh, I don't understand. So this is, this is something about my, that's better? Excellent. Good, good. So, so I, I actually saw my elementary school teacher two years ago. And the thing he, she asked me was if my handwriting was still as bad. And, you know, <laughs> the penalty is. So now, so initial x center of mass before was m1, x1 is 0, so m2 times L over 2 divided by M1 plus L2. How about in the second situation? It's going to be M1 times L plus how, about, how much has the center of mass of the car moved? So now the center of mass is at L over 2 minus x2, right? m2 times l over 2 minus which one? It's m1 times x1, of course. Why did I write l? I don't know. m1 times x1. That must be the jet lag writing the equation. So now m2 times l2 over x2. Any mistakes? Nope. So m1 plus m2. Now, my logic was that the position of the center of mass should not have changed throughout. So m2 l over 2 m1 plus m2 is m1 x1 plus m2 l over 2 minus x2. Now the thing is, I it seems like I have two unknowns, x1 and x2, but I know that they add up to L. So I can write x2 is L minus x1, all right? So I have two equations and two unknowns. Now let me do that. M2 times L over 2 is M1 x1 plus M2 L over 2 minus M2 L minus X1. It's cancelled. 0. M1 X1 minus M2 L plus M2 X1. In other words, M1 plus M2 X1 is m2 times l so apparently i was looking for x1 x1 is l divided by m1 plus m2 times m2 i was given numbers let's figure that out l was 10 meters m2 was 100 kilograms is that right M2 is 
Yes. 100 kilograms. Divided by 180 kilograms. So it's going to be 100 divided by 18. 50 divided by 9. 5.6, right? More or less. Meters. Now, let's look at the result here. X1 is L M2 over M1 plus M2. Not the numerical result, but the analytical result. Did I reach my goal first of all here? Yes, X1 is expressed in terms of the given quantities. How about the unit? M2 is kilogram, M1 plus M2 is kilogram, so they cancel. I'm left with L, so this is meters, it should work out. How about some limits here? What if M2 is infinite? It's infinitely heavy. It doesn't move. In that case, how much should I have volt? I would have volt L, full meter. So what is the limit M2 goes to infinity L times M2 divided by M1 plus M2? It's going to be L. So it's so those limits they teach you in calculus are actually useful things, okay? So it gives me L makes sense. So at, at least that limit we've actually covered quite well. What happens if M2 is zero? M2 is zero means that, I mean, even in the first step I actually take, the whole thing actually slides under me, right? That's, that's what, uh, you cannot really have an object with mass zero under you that's just going to slide away to infinity at any small force you apply to it, okay? Let's solve one more example, all right? So this stick figure is actually James Bond. And as happens in all James Bond movies, somehow he is in a situation where he has ice skates. And his total mass bond, his clothes, his gun, and bullets is M. Each bullet weighs delta M. And Vm is what's called muzzle velocity, velocity of the bullet with respect to gun. Okay. So initially, 007 has zero velocity, find his velocity after he fires two bullets, okay? Hmm. Now, what does that mean? If really these ice skates create no friction, what will happen when James Bond fires a bullet? The bullet will go with some velocity, but there will be a bad reaction because total momentum is conserved. He'll actually be moving 
in the other way, right? So let's figure out. So in the initial situation, there was no velocity. After the first big figure, first bullet is fired. The bullet will have some velocity, let me call Vb1. But James Bond is now moving the other way. Let me call his velocity V1. What do I know? I know the following. First of all, total momentum is conserved. So can I say the mass of the bullet is delta m times v, the, the mass is delta m, so delta m times v bullet 1 must be equal to v1 times, what's the mass here? m minus delta m, okay? So, this is my first equation. How many unknowns do I have? Two, v bullet 1 and v1, James Bond's velocity. But what else do I know? I know that the gun is such that the relative velocity of the bullet with respect to the gun is always vm, v muzzle. Okay? So, my second equation is the following. Vb1 minus minus V1, which is V1, is V muzzle. That's the velocity of the bullet with respect to the gun. If I was standing on a surface, if my velocity did not change, that the bullet velocity would be exactly Vm. But because I'm actually moving back, the bullet velocity will be removed, or will be reduced. Okay, so let's, I have two equations, two unknowns. What should I try to solve for? I should try to solve for V1. That's what I'm interested in. Vv1 is Vm minus V1. So I can actually plug this in here. Delta M times Vm minus V1 is V1 times M minus V1 times delta M. So delta M times Vm minus V1 times delta M is M times V1 minus V1 times delta M. It's cancelled. Apparently, well, as we might have expected, V1 is Delta M divided by M times VM. All right? Good. Now, how about V2? Now, he's going to fire the second bullet. Now, in this case, already before he fires the bullet, he's moving with V1 to the left, right? So his initial momentum is, now the mass is M minus delta M times V1, but it's to the left, so I'll just side put minus. And after he fires the second bullet, I wish I could drove him faster. Okay. Let me call this velocity V2 and the bullet's velocity to be V2B to the right. Mass of the 
mass of uh, the bullet is delta 1. The remaining mass is now m minus 2 delta m here. So my final momentum is delta m times V2B minus m minus 2 delta m times uh, V2. But again, what I, that momentum conservation gives me only one equation. I need one more equation. And that's coming from the velocity of the bullet with respect to the gun. So here again, V2B minus minus V2 must be Vm. So let's write this. P initial is equal to P final. So minus V1 M minus 2 delta M is equal to delta M V2B minus M minus 2 delta M. In the first one, it's delta M as we wrote here, right? So it's M minus delta M. So I should be careful. Thank you. Let's solve for V2 here. Minus V1 M plus V1 delta M is delta M times V2B is Vm minus V2, right, minus M V2 plus 2 delta M times V2. So minus V1 M plus V1 delta M is Vm times delta m minus V2 times delta m minus m V2 plus 2 delta m V2 right so one power of these cancel delta m V2 here I have V2, I'm trying to solve for V2, so I can say minus Vm delta M minus V1M plus V1 delta M is minus M plus delta M V2. That's great. So, what was V1? We've already found it. V1 was delta M over M times Vm. So, let's write it. It's delta M over M times Vm. Same here. Delta M over M times Vm. So, now what do I have? Minus Vm delta M minus M's cancel Vm delta M plus I have delta M square divided by capital M times Vm is minus M plus delta M times V2. In other words, V2 is 1 over M minus delta M times, here what do I have? Uh, Vm, I'll just put out, I have 2 delta M plus del minus delta M squared divided by M times 
times v2. Now, if I actually keep, I can keep doing that every time I throw a delta m out, I'll have an equation like this, OK? For the, uh, regarding the previous, well, the change in velocity, right? So what I will not do, but you can actually pretty much go ahead and solve for the next bullet to the next bullet, and then take delta m going to zero limit. But also take delta t, the time between shots, going to zero limit. This becomes another system that's pretty much how rockets work. So they keep firing away uh, mass at a given muzzle velocity. And they will actually basically give out delta m, delta t, which is called mu, kilograms per second of fuel outside with velocity vm. And they are basically just the continuous limit of this James Bond firing problem. Okay? I will not go through the solution of the rocket equation. It's not hard, but I think it will distract us for nothing, okay? So please study rocket equation in your book. It may come up in a quiz, okay? As soon as maybe next time or the time after that. So let me close this with that remark. Be ready for your quiz. But let me investigate center of mass. For more complicated objects. Now, if I have a collection of point masses. Let's say this is M1, M2, M3, M4. If I have an object like this, how do I find, for example, the x coordinate of the center of mass? Well, my formula is pretty clear. I look at the x coordinate of the first one, multiply it by the mass of that one. Then I look at the coordinate, x coordinate of the second one. Same thing for third mass and fourth mass. And I divide it by the total mass. I can do it for y coordinate. I can do that. But what happens? If I don't have simply point masses, but a continuous object, what happens if I have a continuous object? How do I find the position of the center of mass now? Obviously, that's why you're learning calculus, right? If I have a sum for discrete objects, when I go to a continuous limit, I must turn this into an integral, right? My formula here, x center of mass, was sum over x i m i divided by sum over i. Mi 
now in the continuous limit it sums must turn into integrals so x center of mass will be this is going to be my total mass 1 over mass integral x dot dm that's going to be it okay more generally the most general kind of the formula is that the center of mass position is going to be integral r dm of over all my objects divided by integral dm of all the objects okay let's actually solve an example let's start simple let's say that I have a triangle, let's say even an equilateral triangle, right triangle, which has two perpendicular sides of side L, and it's made up of uniform density object, density material. Let's say I have some wood and I cut it into a right triangle of side L. Well, I would like to find out what's the x center of mass and y center of mass if I position my origin as shown. Please do not take notes. Please follow this example. Okay, just listen to me. Now, how do I solve it. I need to turn this into a collection of infinitesimal masses. All right. Now, let's try to find x center of mass first. What I will do is I will actually take to make think of this triangle as if it's made up of very thin slices which are at length x and have a thickness dx. Okay? Can you tell me what is the height of this slice well it's kind of easy right the distance here is l minus x so i can say there are two similar triangles here this is l this is l so basically h of x must be what equal to l minus x this angle is 45 degrees so whatever i if i had an equilateral if i had a isosceles triangle here i should have an isosceles triangle in the small case so h of x is l minus x so now can you tell me what is the small amount of mass in that area Whatever, I mean, this is going to be proportional to the density of the object that's making up my uh, triangle, Wood's density if you want, times the area of that slice, dA. What's the area of that slice? It's like a rectangle with one side dx. Right, let me draw it. This side is dx. And that side is L minus X. So I will say this is rho times L minus X times DX. And I'm quite amazed that 
No one is actually raising any objections here. Why? Because you can say, hey, hey, this is not really a triangle. You figured and you forgot about this small part, right? What's the area of this small part? Let me actually write the area correctly. My dA must be dx times L minus x. That will be the area, full area. Then I must take out one half dx squared, right? However, here is the thing. What does this dx, what does this differential mean? It's a very small number. It's actually the smallest number you can think of, but it's not zero. Okay, so that's my physicist's definition of a differential. It's smaller than any number you can think of, but it's not zero, right? So if I have dx equal to 0 0.001, what's dx squared? It's 0 0.000001, right? So for differential objects, what you can always do is you can always neglect higher powers of dx. So, and that's not actually neglection. It's actually really zero, okay? That's the nice thing about differential. That's what Newton invented, okay? Once you go to these differentials, you don't care about the higher orders. That's why my formula for dA is correct, right? Hmm. So now I know dm, which is L minus x times, rho times L minus x times dx. And all of this mass is have the same x distance, right? So what was my formula x center of mass? 1 over m times integral x dm, right? That was the formula I wrote up. So now x stays there. I'm writing dm rho times L minus x dx. But what are the limits of my integration? I'm adding up small slices. What's the smallest x possible slice? It starts at 0. I start adding up this first piece. Where do I go until? I go until I basically add the smallest piece at the edge. So x goes from 0 to L. So I must always write those limits of my integration, 0 to L. So let's find out. This is m. Rho is a constant. I'm taking this out. 0 to L. x times L minus x squared times dx. So I have two integrals, m rho. Integral L times x 0 to L dx minus integral 0 to L x squared dx. What's this integral? Integral dx? x squared over 2 x squared over 2 at 0 and L. How about the integral here? x cubed over 3 at 0 to L. So x center of mass is 1 over m rho times L times L squared over 2 minus L cubed over 3. So it's going to be rho L cubed divided by m times 1 half minus 1 third. And that gives me 1 sixth. So x center of mass is 1 over 6 rho L cubed over m. 
But what's M? What's the total area of this object? Area is L square over 2. What's the total mass of this object? Rho is my density, so rho L square over 2 is my mass. Let me write it down. Rho L cube over 6, rho L square over 2. Rho's cancel. 2 powers of L cancels. That gives me 3. So it's apparently the center of mass position of the triangle is at L over 3. Do I need to do the calculation for Y? It's exactly, by symmetry, it's exactly going to be the same. So my Y center of mass and X center of mass will be at L over 3 and L over 3. So that's some result you maybe have memorized in high school, but now we can derive it. And next time, well, I still have time. Good. So I thought the, the class was finished. But let me do one more example, something more interesting. How about the center of mass of a semicircle? Where exactly is the center of mass of a uniformly filled semicircle? Now, Question? The for for any angle. Yeah. Angle meaning? Angle. No, no, okay. So don't 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 offer me any methods other than the true definition, which is the integral, right? And you may have some shortcuts for triangles for circles, but I, then I will ask you an ellipsoid. You won't know how to do it. If you find out the shortcut from a, for an ellipsoid, I'll ask you where the center of mass of a paraboloid is. In that case, you'll have to devise a new formula. Instead of memorizing different formulas for different shapes, let's find out, let's learn how to calculate it. Okay. So here, what's the X center of mass? Where is the X center of mass? This is symmetric, right? This object is symmetric. So I would all right say it's at the center of symmetry. So I can say X center of mass is 0 by symmetry. How about Y center of mass, though? It's not going to be as easy. We now have to do an integral to find out where the Y center of mass is. And for that, here is what I'll do. Let me take a section at height y and thickness dy. Now, can you tell me what's the length here? x at y. Well, if I know the radius, I can immediately tell you that it's going to be r square minus y square square root, right? That's the distance. So can you tell me the mass contained in that area? What's dm? dm is going to be rho times dy times 2 times x of y. Or I can write this as 2 rho square root of r square minus y square times dy. All the points inside this small slice have the same y coordinate. So can you tell me what y center of mass is? Yes, you can. You'll say it's the full mass integral y dm. But now I can write this more specifically. Y coordinate goes from 0 all the way to R. So these are my limits. 
I have 2 rho square root of r square minus y square dy. Can you tell me what mass is, mass of this full object? Well, its area is pi times r square over 2 times rho. Good, let's write that. 1 over pi r square over 2. I don't understand. I missed y. Yes, you're right. I missed what y. I missed y here. Right. So 2 rho is a constant. I'm taking it out. Integral 0 to r square root of r square minus y square times y dy. Rows cancel. But I should... Now this is a, a little bit more complicated integral. Just a little bit more complicated integral. Why? Because here's the trick. If I just change my variables to u, what is du? du is minus 2y dy. Are you following me? Can you do these changes? You've learned that in calculus, right? Good. So let's do this. That's great. I have 4 over pi r squared in front. Now I'm changing my variables. When I change my variables, the first thing you should make sure is you're also changing the limits of the integration. That's easily forgotten. When y is 0, u is r squared. When y is r, u is 0. Square root of r squared minus y squared is square root of u. y dy is apparently minus 1 over 2 times du. Now, 4 over pi r squared. If I'm integrating from a to b, integrating from b to a is just negative of the first thing. So I'll write this as 0 to r squared square root of u du and I'll take this one half out. So this is 2 over pi r squared. What's the integral now? u to the n dn, u to the n du is u to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So this is going to be u to the 3 over 2 divided by 3 over 2 at 0 and r squared. Okay? So 4 over 3 pi r squared is r squared divided by 3 halves. So this whole thing is 4r divided by 3 pi. So apparently, the y coordinate of the center of mass is it is very non-trivial place. It's 4 divided by 3 pi away from the origin. Okay? And we would expect it to be somewhere closer to the center. But this number is not something you can actually just make up. It's not 1 third. It's not 1 sixth. It's a nice thing. It's good that we have actually found that out. I'll see you in two days. Oh, three days.